Fantastic. So everyone, welcome to our fall development series. Uh, this is going to be the first part of four. Uh, we did the two weeks apart, alternated Tuesdays and Thursdays. I am aware that Tuesday and Thursday is a popular practice day. Um, so the videos will be recorded. I'm also going to send out a little PDF cheat sheet after that covers everything that we covered. Um, I'm going to try to put this on YouTube, on the TRA YouTube, so we have access to it. Obviously, the benefit of attending live is that you can ask questions. So there's 20 of us on this call right now. We're all TRA referees, so we're in a friendly space. So if you have questions, please just unmute, ask questions. Um if you can only write in the chat, that's fine, but I probably won't be monitoring the chat. So um, Ozzy, if you want to check on the chat and if somebody posts something, you can jump in um, and ask questions. I do have some videos um, in the presentation. I know that some people's internet might be lagging, my internet might be lagging. So I'm going to go through them each at least three times, once full speed, twice probably slowing it down where we need to see, and then just kind of going step by step. So even if it is lagging, we'll probably get what we need to see. Hope that sounds good to everyone. And yeah, I'm going to get started. Okay. Didn't work. Okay. So. We're gonna tackle the breakdown first. Huh, that was a dead joke, if you got it. Um, so the breakdown is a massive part of any game. These are the things that I'm gonna touch on today. Tackle checklist, I know everyone's heard it a million times before, but at the highest level, this is the only thing we care about, really. it's. It keeps following you everywhere you are. So having a good checklist and getting through that is critical. But then we're going to get into setting standards. What's that mean? Management, when to manage, when to not. And then a bit about repeat infringements and cynical infringements. So first thing we're going to go through is our tackle checklist. And by checklist, I mean a process in your brain that you go through anytime a tackle happens. Uh, so sometimes the tackle is really clear and nobody's contesting for the ball and balls at the back and we play on and that's great. But particularly where you have a lot of people at the breakdown and a lot of people contesting, you wanna go through this checklist and make sure that everything happens in order so we're going to look at the tackler and the tackle assist first and that's the first thing you're going to care about tackle happens you're going to say is the tackler and the tackler assist getting out of the way you're not going to look to reward a ball carrier holding on if there's still a tackler or a tackle assist in the area preventing the attacking team from clearing out the defense Likewise, you're not going to really start going at what the jackler's done wrong if the ball carrier is crawling on the ground with the ball. So if that makes sense. The number one thing, tackle, tackler, assist, is probably the number one thing you're going to penalize at the tackle area. And then once that's completely clear, then you're going to start looking at the ball carrier not releasing. So I've got clips and we'll explain further. This little diagram is from the game management guidelines. If you haven't checked them out, they're on the website. They make it make things a bit easier to understand as well. And then I included definition of a tackle here just because I think it's really important to know what is a tackle and what isn't in law. So a lot of the time we see someone who has the ball get kind of thrown to ground, get back up, and you're mentally like, ooh, do they need to release the ball or not? So remembering a tackle in law is really helpful. If they're not held to ground, 
there's not a tackle, they don't have to release the ball. If they're held to ground, it's a tackle, they need to release the ball. So hopefully that, I always like to bring it back to that. Cool. Oh, there's my videos. Cool. So we're going to get into the videos. Um, There is sound for these videos. Hopefully it comes across well because we definitely need it later. I don't know how loud it is. So if it's really, really loud, just let me know. Ooh, that's really, really loud. At least for me it is. Okay. So obviously a lot of things happening. So we've got ball carrier clearly held to ground. Here is the Samoan player. Knee on the ground. This Japanese player has held her to ground. Ball comes out on Japan's side because that player is still holding on to her. Um, so the easiest thing to do here is get that tackler out of there, get yourself a clean release, especially because if you let this play out, you're going to have a lot of mess in the rest of the game. Awesome. I'll let, her, I'll let her penalize this. So that is our tackler. So this is a picture that I feel like I see all the time. You've got a really, really good jackal by um, South Africa 8 there. But go through the tackle checklist, what's the number one thing we have to get rid of before we can penalize the ball carrier and reward the jackler? Is this South African player who's on the wrong side still in the tackle area? So that sets a really clear message. You got to get number one tacklers out of the way releasing before you can even start to reward players. Cool. How we feel about the tackler, tackle assist. I love a tackler not rolling. Excellent. Um, so when we also say tackler not rolling, what is the tackler? What do they have to do? How how do they get out of that breakdown? Ideally, we want them to get out of the way and not roll into incoming attack support players and or the nine. Nice. Thanks, Dono. And so we <laughs> like to refer to that as east-west. You got your breakdown going up the field. You want them to roll east-west, not north-south. Well, they can roll north because it's their own way but you don't want them to roll into the nine because that's affecting the ball delivery so good communication there roll out east west all right now we love everyone loves a turnover it's massive in the game it makes you feel really powerful when you award it so we've got the tackler out of the way good picture I've actually got a nice replay on this one.
So what we're looking uh, for the for the jockler here and the ball carrier, jockler has to be in a position of strength. And so for for me, that means, you know, hips over feet, supporting their own body weight. They clear, she's clearly not the tackler. So she doesn't have hands on the player as she's being tackled. She gets hands on the ball and there's a clear lift. I think what's really key about a ball carrier not releasing penalty is there has to be a bit of a static moment in that you take a, we like to say, take a breath at the tackle. If the tackle happens and you like, in that moment, there's nothing still happening. Scotland has clear hands on that ball and she's not letting it go, which she should because she has rights to it and she's not getting it, which tells me in the moment, I need to call something here. I see a lot of really quick ball carrier not releasings and we really just want to reward the clear and obvious ones, right? So, yes. Someone say something. Dang, I got really excited. Hmm. Right. So we're taking a breath at this moment. Because Scotland could come away with the ball. If she comes away with the ball, there's no infringement. Because the infringement is ball carrier not releasing. But if she has the ball, the ball carrier did clearly re release, and she got a turnover. But because it's delayed... We've got that clear pause. That's the picture we want to see for a ball carrier not releasing. Cool. Any questions on the ball carrier? So step three, we're going to go to our Jackler, a jackler can also have any number of infringements when they're going for the breakdown. So we need, like we said, need to see them in a position of power, need to see them on the ball, need to see a clear lift. Hmm. Right, so the picture that we're seeing there, she does have rights to that ball. And just as an aside, if we ever get into a situation where two players reach um, the breakdown at the same time, we do want to let that play out and see kind of who's in a better position. Um, just because at the same moment, white comes into Bruck, while black goes for the ball, we don't want to be saying that's a ruck and penalizing for hands in the ruck. You, if it's simultaneous, just take a breath and see what happens. But here, clearly, black is not in a position of power when she goes for that ball. Now, if she releases and gets out of the way really quickly, we can play on. <laughs> Obviously, she doesn't. Um, To penalize. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So, so, Kat, the, yes. the issue there was the, the defender fell over the ball and was not supporting her weight. Was that? Yep. Yep. So she's just never in a position of power, right? She's not supporting her own weight. And she, if she released that ball and England gets that ball nice and clean, you can play away from that and there's no issue as long as the ball's not slowed down. And we'll say that when it comes to um, setting standards and management, talk about that a bit more. But yeah, she's off her feet and she continues to go for that ball. And you also mentioned that if there was almost a tie, you would, you would hold off and let the play, let the jackler have a chance at the ball. 
if the chaplain and the defender get over the ball about the same time. Yeah. Yeah. If it's simultaneous and the defense goes for the jackal while the attack comes in to clear out, I'm going to let that play out because the only time I really want to penalize for hands in the rough is when you've got a ruck clearly formed and like a player scoops back to knock the ball backward or picks the ball up clearly when they've already been committed to rucking. But if it's a tie, just let it play out a little bit and really decide who's doing their job better. Um, so is the clear out got a really good clear out in or is the jackler in a really strong position and it's a really crappy clear out? Because if the jackler's in a really strong position and it's a bad clear out, I'd reward the jackler. If the jackler's not doing a great job, you know, maybe strong, like straight arms, not even lifting the ball, and you've got a good clear out, either play through or you can manage, you know, whatever color team release. And then if you want to add comms to that, be like, no clear lift. Yeah, because I was going to ask, how strict are you on how cleanly the jackler is pulling? I mean, you know, local rugby, they're, they're not always as clean as in jackling, and sometimes they're slapping at the ball and pushing it around. Yeah, so I actually go, when I talk to the teams um, beforehand, I usually say, for me, a good jackal is actually stealing that ball. And the only time that I'm going to reward you on a jackal is if the only reason you're not getting that ball is because they're clearly holding on to it. Hmm. And then that gets me right. I, a clear lift. I get those bent elbows, the real showing me they are supporting their own body weight because if they just have flat arms on the ball, I'm not going to call against them, but I'm just going to kind of wait a second. And usually they're just going to get cleared off. But that's exactly it's a, it's a really good point of just share your expectations. Be like, I'm happy to reward you, but you got to show me everything that you're doing to win that ball. Otherwise, nah. And especially in the club game, you can manage a bit more. And you've lost it now. Release and play away. Okay. And then this last one. Um, Attacking support, it's not something, I'll be honest, that we usually usually identify in games. Um, it's rare. It happens more in sevens. Um, I'll humble brag because this is my game and, you know, I got it, but um, not going to be that big of a dick. So it's usually when a team is really under pressure. Um, so there is a replay for this one as well. So for me in this picture, this Scotland player is all rights to the ball. She's in a position of strength. She has full rights to go for that ball. The only reason she doesn't get it is because Japan goes in and that's not the worst picture we've ever seen absolutely uh, but she does go in just straight to put her hands on the ground instead of on her player if she's going and puts her hand on her, on her player i'd play on but the fact that both of her hands are beyond her player on the ground and that prevents the contest um typically here we look at plane landing versus plane taking off if the player is always a plane landing and is always going down, then you that's more of the picture you want to penalize. If a player is plane taking off, right, they're driving through, we're not going to look to penalize that. Um, something I see a lot is we penalize off feet when there's either a really strong ruck or a really strong counter ruck, and you drive somebody off the ball and then kind of fall over onto your own player. For me, that's not off feet, even though it that player does end up off their feet. It's because they 
have done their job. They've cleared out the other player and there's nothing to push. <laughs> so it's not their fault that they've gone off their feet. So I'm not going to penalize them because it's not their fault. It's a different picture. If they're plane landing, they're killing a contest. They're just flopping over the ball, kind of like this one. Can I, this is Ross. Can I ask yeah. a question to the, to the group? Where where else would we see that? Where else in the game would we see an attacking support player? Or where would you notice it? Pat, you're going to know this easy, but um, I just put it out to anyone else. Um, you I'll just end um, I see that um, that also when there's a rock, sorry, there's a mall. In the mall, I see that uh, that force yeah, in my games. Right. Yeah. Do we notice, um, do you ever notice if you're watching the elite game and you will, if you do the higher club game, when teams are trying to kill the clock and they pick and go, you'll see this a lot. The attack in support will, you see the, the really elite refs will say, arrive upwards and they will ping it if there's a pick and go to kill the clock. That's what I'm getting at. Kat, you've seen that, I'm guessing. Yeah, we call the the latcher, or you'll see the attacking at the goal line. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Now, it's not something you really want to go hunting for, because if you start looking for it, you'll see it everywhere. But just being aware of, you know, I've got a strong jackler in a good position. Why did she not get the ball? Well, it's because the other team killed the contest. Because <clears throat> recognized that's a strong jackler in a strong position. And if I don't do this, I'm going to lose the ball. So awesome. So that's our tackle checklist. Go through it every time. It never changes by really going through and identifying these pictures. You can start to build your mental book of what it looks like. And so when you see it in a game, you'll see good pictures, good pictures, good pictures. And then the bad ones will really stand out to you. So that's what I like to do is I like to watch a lot of good things, a lot of good play, tackle, clear out, ball available, continue. And then when you see the wrong one, it's really obvious because you're like, whoa, that is not what I've been looking at. That's a bad picture. Somebody sent something wrong here. Oh, my God. Oh. Yikes. Awesome. So that's our checklist. Happy to get through that. We're going to get into some of the, I don't know, higher level stuff, not higher level stuff, but stuff I feel like we don't really get into detail about. So setting standards, I'm sure everybody here has heard uh, when we, we set standards in a game. When, when do we look to set standards? Why do we set standards? All the buzzwords you've heard. Uh, one of the places to do it is when there's a very clear and obvious infringement. So, you know, the obvious high tackle or at a ruck, someone's clearly coming in from the side. When you blow that penalty right away, everyone saw that picture and goes, oh, that's bad. And it's a good way of just showing, hey, this isn't allowed today. So you know, with those very clear penalties, it's a good way of showing, you know, helping manage everyone because they see the picture, they see the penalty, one and two, boom, don't do that anymore. Awesome. Anywhere specifically on the field, anywhere during the game, I know Sean said early. Early, yep. Chris Pugh said something great, call it immediately. When you're setting a standard, just like Jono said, you don't want to play advantage, come back to it and be like, ah, number four did something because nobody knows what number four did. They don't really care. They just know it's a penalty against them. But if you're right there, you have a picture penalty, that player is doing something wrong. And everyone's like, ah, that guy on the ground on the wrong side of the tackle, they're doing something wrong. Okay. Um, Along that, they should be consistent to both teams. So setting standards is really like your opening statement to teams of this is what I'm allowing today. This is what I'm not allowing. In that, they have to be achievable. So you don't want to, 
you don't want to set something that's so unrealistic that you're not going to be able to maintain it for the rest of the match. I remember I set a not rolling penalty before I think the ball was even kicked off because I was so excited about a tackler not rolling. And I then had this expectation that tacklers had to disappear for the rest of the match. And it was just not achievable. I I couldn't maintain that. And then clear in their message, when you when you have your first couple of breakdowns, you're kind of telling the teams what they should be striving to do. So if you're going to reward a jackler when you've got a tackler in the area still, the teams are going to be like, cool, we don't really have to roll away and we should go for this ball. Likewise, when you look at space right around the breakdown, if you're you have somebody who's kind of like halfway up the rock offside at the pillar and then they jump on the nine and you say ball was out play on you <clears throat> have that for the rest of the game because the teams have said that's okay okay let's do it um so you want them to be really clear of like this is where i draw the line you want to try to help yourself out have clear breakdowns clear off sidelines right we always say clear and obvious but what you call is really you drawing your line in the sand. And then obviously for my story about me setting a standard right on the first kickoff, we get really kind of excited the first 10 minutes because you want to set your standard, but the perfect opportunity will be given to you. So don't go looking for it because you'll the first 10 minutes is usually when teams are going to be on their best behavior. So that's when it's going to be really obvious when somebody's not doing something right. Outside of that, they're probably going to be pretty good. So on to that. All right, so what are some things we notice about the context of this match? It's five minutes in. Five minutes in? What's the score? Zero, zero. Zero, zero. zero. <laughs> I'm not going to answer my own question. And added benefit, we're in the middle of the field. You don't really have to pay attention to that, but it is a benefit. We're in the middle of the field. What I really like about this is there's a tackle right before the one that's called that if the referee was over eager about setting standards, she might blow the whistle there. And she takes a breath. The ball is available super quick it's slowed down for maybe a quarter of a second but she doesn't jump the gun she waits for the one that is so clear and obvious everybody can see right you kind of had a player stuck in there but she's doing a pretty good job she's doing everything she can to get out happy balls available And we've got the one who, at the time she still penalizes it, that player is still on the ground. So the standard's not too high, but it's really clear that's not going to be tolerated. Cool? Love that. Go, Meg. Hey, Kat, on, on rolling away, how much, um, how much do you – by the argument sometimes defenders says they were they were held couldn't roll away yeah you hear that all the time oh i was trapped all the time. and sometimes you even go to practices where the players are like oh if you just flail around the referee will see that they're trying to get out and that's not very true sometimes 
as the tackler, you just get trapped on the wrong side of the ball. And I'm still going to penalize a tackler on the wrong side of the ball. And when they say, but I was stuck, I'm going to say, you fell on the wrong side. Right? So you're really trying to encourage, because in a in a good tackling situation, in a dominant tackle, like you're on that side, right? Because you drive that player back. But even there, <clears throat> if you want to get out, you can get out, or you can at least make a dang good effort to get out. Um, so if a player says they're trapped, say you've got to fall on the, on your side of the ball. You can't fall on the attack side of the ball. Uh, Kate, you could argue that she was out of the way enough that the ball was playable, couldn't you? For the second one? Yeah. No, <laughs> um, you have a jackler there. If you didn't okay. have a jackler, I would agree. But because that player is going for the ball... Okay. Yeah, and it is arguable because, right, by the time we're blowing the penalty, we do have the ball available, but that's where we say, this is the time she's going to set her standard of, like, nah, get out of there. Yeah, I mean, it's cool, it's cool. Yeah, but it's a really good point. Okay, so now we've got some other examples. All right. So what do we notice about that clip? Where are we? The infamous side and the obvious carrying on. Where are we in the game? The very first kickoff. We have just kicked off the game. <laughs> and um, what are we doing from this? Just trying to play advantage. So we're trying to play advantage off of this. And now we're going to pass it back. And we're going to end up coming back to this. And nobody's going to know what that was for. Key here, just let this breathe an extra second. You just started the game. Wait for the one that's clear and obvious. Wait for the one that's handed to you on a silver platter of the most clear release. Because now you've set a bit of an unrealistic standard for yourself, and you're going to have a lot of work to keep that up. All right. And then we've got this one. All right. Just entering. What do we notice about time and place? I didn't think we started. Yeah. We're right at the start again. We're 40 seconds in. What are what are thoughts about this? The one's on the floor can't get away. We've got a yeah, we got a tackler on the floor in the way. Can't hear you very well. It was a little hard for me to see, Kat, but this is one where I would have trouble saying whether the ruck was formed first or not. At least I I was hard for me to see in the choppy video, but it was so quick. Maybe you saw it better than I did. No, no. I think I mean I think really here there's a lot of things happening at 
this breakdown. And when there's a lot of things happening at a breakdown, to come away with a ball carrier not releasing penalty for me is probably the most dangerous. Because if I'm their team right now, and the first penalty of the match is going to be a ball carrier not releasing, in my mind that says, oh, I'm going after every ball I can get my hands on. If the first penalty of the match is a tackler not rolling, I know we got to get out of that breakdown. If the first penalty of the match is maybe an offside, because we have this blue player who, once the rough moves, is is she onside right? She's probably in front of the last foot here. So is she onside? If that's the first penalty of the game, my message is we really got to make sure we're onside today. So if you're going to have an opportunity like this, where now we've had that, it's really messy, and we're going to reward a ball carry not releasing, you've just set yourself up for 80 minutes of dealing with that picture again and again and again. Because players now know that is the picture that gets rewarded. So all things to consider when you're setting your standards. It's a really good opportunity to say, this is what I want to work with for the rest of the match. Awesome. Thanks. So moving on to management. Management is great because we get to talk and we love talking. Everybody loves talking. Um, but when... When do we manage? Because you don't want to talk at every single breakdown. But there's a lot of opportunities when you can talk and it works. Um, for me, the biggest one that I've noticed is manage when nobody's waiting to play the ball. So that's a that takes a bit of a wider view. Because if there's not a nine there that's wants to play fast and is prevented from playing fast has the slowing down of the ball really become material probably not now if somebody illegally slows the ball down and they're you know right by the goal line and we'll talk later about cynical infringements you can't manage because the defense has now gotten an unfair advantage being that they slowed the ball down, they are able to set up their defensive line. But if the nine wasn't there anyway and nobody wanted to play that ball anyway, what did they slow down? So you can you can use that moment to say, hey, hands away, release, because they didn't really do anything. So, And then you can prevent a penalty from becoming material. So telling players, right, that's that's like on the fringes, telling them to step back. If um, I always like the look in the player's eyes they get when they're right at the breakdown, you see them being like, I'm going to go after that ball. It's usually when they want to play the nine and they're like, I'm going to do it. And you're like, don't do it. And they're like, oh, don't do it. Okay. Because you can see that look. It's, it's never a surprise. Um, one thing that I learned uh, at the world rugby level is don't manage a legal player off the ball when their teammate committed an infringement. So you see this a lot when the first player didn't roll and I would always try to manage off the teammate um, in the club game in lower levels. You can do this just for the sake of keeping the game going. Um, but it's also something to keep in your mind that, you do have to let the jackler know why you're managing them off. Because if you just say no, no hands, they're not going to have a clear message of why they can go for the ball or not. And that's what we're always trying to do is give these players clear messages about what they can do, what they can't do and why. So we can all piece the game together. Does that make sense? Is that cool? Do we have any opinions about that? I would love to hear if people think differently. Yeah, I, I think one of the points you said is good. It's, you know, managing is different for levels. 
like if some of us that are in the higher talks, I know in D1A, you'll hear like Amanda Cox. Say, you know, <laughs> sometimes breakdowns are so fast that you can't really manage if it's quick. But for a lot of us, you know, when we've got our high school games or those D3, D2 games, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there where we can step in and manage. Um, but it's also, you know, making sure we don't overmanage. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's great. That's the key thing. You don't want to overmanage because then you're constantly talking and there's just so much that you can use your whistle to communicate as well, but you also don't want to be blowing 40 penalties because then you don't, nobody's really playing rugby. Becca asked, is there a good strategy to communicate to the jackler uh, when it's their teammate's fault, not theirs? I just like to do it that way. If I'm going to say blue, no hands, you're fine. Your player hasn't rolled. Um, Whether I'm calling it or if I'm saying it in the moment. Because sometimes really in a slower game, you do have that moment where you're like, no hands, blue, leave it. And they're like, what? And you're, like, you're fine. Your player hasn't rolled. Oh, okay. It's Jimmy's fault. It's not my fault. Always get them to blame their teammates. Not you. It's not your fault. Cool. So I've got two clips here on management. I, I'm i going to keep apologizing that I'm in a lot of these clips, but it's just how it is, guys. You just get excited. All right. So what do we notice about that time and place? Where are we What's going on? Game is out of hand. Yeah. It's end of the game, it's almost over. It's end of the game. Scotland's got a lot of points. Japan has not so many points. It's Japan that's got hands on the ball. When you watch this clip again. The nine is not even in the picture until right now. She's chilling in behind me. These players are all coming in to clear out. She's quite unbothered about when she needs to go get the ball. She's not there waiting for it. So she still gets the ball exactly when she would get the ball. They were always going to do a set play. They weren't going to go for the quick attack because Japan was always going to have that that back line set up but if you really look at the score and the time this is the moment where you you can manage you get a positive outcome because nobody's really affected as opposed to So time and place again, we're six minutes in, it's zero, zero. We've got a tackle now, somebody's off their feet on the ball. This nine wants to play it. This nine is like, has enough time to be like, bro, what, where is my ball? And then is forced to play slow ball. Are there any thoughts about differences between those clips, similarities between those clips? Thoughts? Yeah, and clearly, Kat, you showed us in the second clip that was a bad time to manage. Would you call a penalty there? Just, I mean, it, it could be three points based on where it is. Yeah, well, you know, that's the funny part is – I don't know what I would actually do in that situation. I would probably try to say nothing and see if 
Moa can clear her off on her own. Because I find when you say nothing, you get in a lot less trouble because you haven't yet communicated what you're going to do. If you say no, if you say hands away, and the player doesn't do that, you're kind of backed in to penalizing that player. If you say nothing and take a breath and see what happens, that player could have easily released. We could have had clean ball, and I would have just played away. But if she had been off her feet, held on to that ball and not released, yeah, I would have penalized her. You never know. And the key is, the less you say, the less you'll get in trouble for saying stuff. I had a lot of trouble for saying stuff. Hmm. All right. So that's just a little bit on management. There, there really is a lot more that I'm not going to dive into because management is not one of those black and white things in the law book. It is the gray area that we live in and we excel in. So that's just kind of my tips regarding the breakdown, when to manage, when not. Take it or leave it. Uh, a little bit into repeated infringements and cynical infringements. So we're talking about potential conversations you have with the captain and or cards that you're going to give. Remember, there's kind of three three kinds of repeated infringements. The same infringement by a team. Think repeated not rollings. Similar infringements by a team. If you've got a lot of defensive breakdown infringements, maybe in, in the 22, or you've got mall infringements, it's not always the same thing, but sometimes it's collapsing, sometimes it's swimming, you've got two side entries and a collapse. Similar, but not the same. And then infringements by an individual player, which if you just have somebody who is the enforcer and is out to test the rules... You'd be like, I've said number seven four times. I'm sending you to the bin because you keep breaking the law. So remembering your escalation tools and what you have in your toolbox. An informal warning. This can be a chat with a player. You know, you call a penalty. You're going the way to the line out. And you're just like, hey, number seven, that's two on you. I just need you to ease it up. A formal warning. Can someone give me an example of what a formal warning is what kind of makes it different than an informal warning. Uh, you call the captain over and tell him you're sick of it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you take time off, you kind of make it a show because you take time off, you actually get the captain involved. And what does that, ex what does that tell to everybody else watching? What does that tell to the other team? What's the visual of that? Serious. Yeah, everybody sees that happening, and all they're gonna say is, "I bet someone just put it in the chat too." That yeah, well, the next one's probably gonna be a yellow card because you know that this has been happening, and everybody knows you know. So an informal warning is a really great casual way to get the person that you know is doing it. Or you can do it at a, if, it, if it's a whole kind of forward pack issue, I'll do it at the line out at the next one. As I'm setting up the line out, guys, I need you to take an extra step at the breakdown. You kind of look at all of them. Awesome. There's an informal warning. They know you know, but everybody else doesn't. As soon as you have a formal warning, everybody else knows. And everybody's now waiting for that next step, which is going to be a yellow card. So just remembering your tools, best time to use them. These are the kind of questions I like to ask. And so in each of these clips, I'm going to ask if we, you kind of think about these. So when you hear the referee having a chat, what's the reason? What does the referee need from the players? And what's going to happen if they don't get what they need? If they need, and then does it back them into a corner? Um, so can everybody hear the audio on the previous clips? Yes. Okay. Hopefully these will be clearer. I recorded them a different way. 
Um, but we're just listening to the referee audio in, in the background. All right. So what was the reason for the chat? Never heard anything. Didn't hear it. Yeah, I couldn't hear it either. You didn't hear the audio at all? No, I knew the good audio. Oh, that's why. Yeah, no one did. What's they have it. Well, that's why I asked if people could hear the audio. I thought it was yeah, just me. We're all shy. <laughs> Clearly. Um, Can you turn the volume up? Um, I can't, actually. It was already on maximum. Uh, no, if it was the first one, it was on nothing. No, I just turned it off. Um, nothing. We can. Okay. Do you want to just paraphrase it, Kat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she says, uh, she calls the captain number three, says, after the last tackle here, you pushed a guy. Please don't do that. Um, and then she talks to the captain again, calls him kind of over and says, captain, just get the boys back at the breakdown. Yeah, just a bit tight. Just get the boys back. And then we restart with the scrum. And that's not paraphrasing. That's pretty much verbatim what she says. So given that, can you answer those questions? What's the reason that she had that chat? Boys back in the scrum. Right There's some players making or player making some tacky. Yeah, there not is. worth infringing outright unless they keep on doing it. Cool. Yeah, it was starting to get out of hand. Yep, there's a little bit of push and shove. Okay. Um, what does she need from the players? <clears throat> she needs them to get back to playing normal rugby and not. Uh, Wasting everyone's time with the, the extra pushing. Cool. She needs players to not push. What's going to happen if they don't do that? Well, they're going to embarrass themselves by getting a silly penalty, possibly a card. Yeah. After she didn't, this type of warning. <laughs> yeah. She didn't back herself into a corner. She didn't say gonna be a yellow card the next push i see um but the only thing i would say there's a bit of caution when she said push your players back it's a bit tight if i'm a captain i'm gonna absolutely never tell my team that because all i hear is we are doing our job really really well if they're offside they're offside if they're not offside they're not offside they're not going to just make your job easier if you're not going to call them on penalties. Does that make sense? Like teams, like if you're like, hey, it's a bit tight, just take a step. I'd be like, no, penalize me when I'm offside. Otherwise, I'm going to stay a bit tight because I want them to take down their space. Um, conscious of time. I think I'm just going to play this one. I, you guys can't hear it, so I will say the story. Number nine, offside. So giving a penalty for number nine offside. 
He calls number nine up. Nine and captain. He says, that's two times on you, number nine. Two, two times offside. Sort yourselves out and sends him away. Hmm. Now, what is the time of the game? Wow. Yeah, so we're four minutes. Yeah, minutes. we're we're four four minutes into the game, and number nine has been offside twice. Now, if I'm the Uruguay captain, if number nine is offside at the next breakdown, what am I going to be doing? If I'm Uruguay here, if I'm in the light blue, be asking for penalty at least. I'm going to be asking for a yellow card. I mean, you just talked to number nine. You said he's offside twice. We made a big show of it. We took time off. Exactly, Gary. He, he, you just said it. He's been offside twice. Yeah, and you really, I just realized he actually penalized him twice as well. So, yeah. Yeah, he was very, he was very clear. The reason for the chat, what he needed from the players. But the, the seriousness of it being a formal chat has told all of us what's going to happen if they don't continue. So that's a really great opportunity for an informal chat. Go to the scrum. Uruguay's asking for a scrum. Go to the scrum. Talk to the nine. That's twice on you. You need to get on side, right? Then just you and the player who's infringing know it's not a big deal. Um, Just to get into our last... Bit. We're probably going to go a little over an hour. I'm sorry. Cynical infringements. So what makes an infringement a cynical infringement? If it's deliberate, where it is, if the defense, the player committing it is under intense pressure or preventing the attack from a golden opportunity, right? So you usually see this at the goal line, a deliberate, uh, we talk about, right, deliberate knock-ons. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a deliberate, a cynical not rolling away or killing the ball, typically at the goal line, because really you want to prevent the attack from scoring. Um, my key thing here is it doesn't need a warning. It can just be a yellow card. It doesn't have to be, but it if it's cynical, it usually is. And it doesn't negate repeated infringements. So if you have continuous offsides at the goal line and a team is on a warning and then somebody cynically doesn't roll away and you yellow card them, that doesn't mean, Whew, okay, I gave a yellow card, I'm I'm done. They can still be on a warning for offside because that hasn't changed. So it's all about how you communicate with the players and let them know, hey, you guys are still on a warning because just because that guy did or that player did something supremely stupid doesn't mean all the little stupid things you've done have been forgotten. If that makes sense. So the questions I like to ask for this, where are we on the field? Is it deliberate? Is that team under intense player? And what would have happened if that player didn't do that? So... We're going to be watching Kenya over here by the goal line. Kenya is in red. Mm. Right. So what we've got here is number 10 makes a tackle, rolls to the side. Great job. He stays in this offside position. Yeah, Samoa doesn't – he gets out of the way. He's still on the ground. He's still offside. When Samoa picks and goes on the weak side, he makes the tackle from an offside position from the ground. So where are we on the field? We're at the goal line. Is it deliberate? Yeah. Are they under immense pressure? Nah. 20 to 8. There's a couple of defenders there. I wouldn't say it's immense pressure. They're under pressure. It's not immense. Immense. What would happen if that player didn't infringe? Probably would have gotten tackled by somebody else. So 
it might not reach the highest level of cynical, but it's definitely something to consider of like, was it deliberate? Yeah, he made zero attempt to get back on side and was really panicked when somebody picking was picking and going. So um it ends up it was a yellow card for repeat infringements, hilariously enough. But <laughs> let's do something. And then this last one, we're going to be watching Seattle at the goal line here. So number 15 makes the tackle and very lovely. Those are his two legs. Squats over the player to prevent him from putting the ball back. Now, where are we on the field? We're at the goal line. Was it a deliberate action? Yeah, he l literally adjusts himself so the ball can't come out. What would have happened if he didn't do that? Nola's probably picking and scoring right there. So this is super cynical action. And... Referee, <laughs> yellow cards him. We'll talk about yellow carding a player on the ground like that, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so does it check off my boxes? Where are we on the field? Yep, deliberate action, absolutely. Are they under immense pressure? 100%. What would have happened? Probably a score. That doesn't mean we're going for a penalty try. It just means that guy's definitely going to the bin. All right, I know we kind of rushed through that last bit. I'm I'm sorry, I just wanted it to be under an hour and I failed. Um, so just a recap of a couple of things that we went over, our tackle checklist, one, two, three, four. When you set standards, just the questions you kind of ask yourself. Management, questions you ask yourself. With repeat infringements, remember your escalation process and your toolbox, what tools you have available. Cynical infringement, is it deliberate? Is it under immense pressure? Um, the last thing I have for you, obviously, is tips and tricks from a pro. That is me getting tackled in Australia. Yes, it was great. Um, these are kind of my favorite little tips that I think about in games. Don't reward a jackler if the tackler is still in the area. Take a breath when you have a contest at the breakdown. Don't back yourself into any corners. Don't hunt for a place to set standards. I've done that way too many times. Talk only when no one's waiting to play the ball. If someone's waiting to play the ball, it's not a great time to talk. And then don't back yourself into a corner with escalation. Because if you say the next one's a card, the next one's got to be a card, no matter how silly it is. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's, it's quite, this was, this was not my fault. She just tackled me. Um, so that's breakdown. Um, I do have a little PDF form I will send out to you guys. I hope everyone screenshotted that for their savings later. Awesome. I went four minutes over. I apologize. I will be better next time. Um, but thank you guys all for attending. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I will stop the recording, but I will stay on if anybody has any questions. Right.